that's Hall Knight cantering down there. He was fourth at kept top weight, carrying nine stone 12, so he's giving nine pounds or more to all the others. Fourth at Kempton over a mile and three when Smoke Singer was third. He's held on that form by Smoke Singer. They finished behind Maul Light. He was third, beaten four lengths by Watermill and Mars Marvel at Goodwood. Uh, he just really hasn't quite got into top gear this uh, year. He had some good form last year. He ran a cracker in the champion, in fact. I think he was placed as far as I can remember. But he hasn't really got into his uh, top gear so far this year. Going down fast enough and well enough anyway. Number two, top weight, Paul Knight. Number ten, that's one of the last to leave. Oh, we've seen him actually, that's fine blue. Where is he? he must be in front of me here somewhere, I can't see him. He's one of the last, in fact, to leave the paddock and we've already talked about him. 25 and 10, in fact, we've talked about both those. Along with him is uh, Haleo, the Epsom challenger. Number 10, fine blue. Trained by Peter Makey in this one at Marlborough and ridden by Steve Cawthon. He's a horse and in Tau, there's a seven-year-old son of French vine. As they come down to start, Ken, that's one Fleet Street followed by Easter Sun. One Fleet Street we've not seen, nor have we seen Easter Sun. Oh, if one Fleet Street, I beg your pardon, we have seen, but Easter Sun, if we can drop back, we haven't seen. There he is. Easter Sun. Uh, he's a colt by Bastino, a three-year-old carrying eight stone four. So as the youngsters go, he's got the top weight for a three-year-old and he's had a pretty successful season. Uh, last time out, he was third at Sandown at the end of August behind One Fleet Street, beaten about three lengths. And on that form, in fact, he is held by One Fleet Street. Uh, he was a game second to world leader on the July course when he was beaten ahead. And he was a winner here over a mile and a half, in fact. So there's absolutely no doubts at all about him getting the course. That's number 12, Easter Sun. Majestic star now in the pitch. I think you've talked about that one. And now we have a close-up here. Let's go with the left-hand one, because that's the top weight, number two, Hall Knight in the brown colours. Whom we actually talked about as he cantered down, John, a son of Far Street, this, a bright chestnut, ridden by Lester Piggott. Ever on the hunt to reduce that uh, gap against Willie Carson, as he's head down to six now, which is the nearest he'd been for some time. That's 24, though. We haven't seen that one. Number 24, Prince's Gate. Very much fancied by a lot of people I know. The amount of Ernie Johnson. A fine run uh, landed him a winner at Goodwood. He beat Cypress Sky by no less than four lengths. That was a really good performance last time out. He was fourth at Newcastle to Atlantic Boy. He's well handicapped on that running. And as you can see with those three ones before that, he's had a very successful season. He won three races, two at Salisbury, and then one at Goodwood in a row. And despite all that, this afternoon, he's still only got seven stone, ten to carry this three-year-old son of realm. Number 24, Prince's Gate. 21 going through there. That's is majestic, majestic star. star 22 if we go left we just missed uh, 22 there's 22 i think that uh, is number 22 king's ride this is a coat by rarity rarity is normally like it a bit softer he's a four-year-old carrying seven stone 12. he beat Les soleil ahead at kempton early in september he was twice behind tender heart before that at york and at royal ascot but he won the irish sweeps lincoln in great style that's number 22 can he make the double king's ride and now we have more betting. It's just come into the betting at 20 to 1. The favourite, Tender Heart, now 9 to 2 from 5 to 1. One Flea Street, steady at 9s, and Prince's Gate at 10s. Easter Sun is 11 to 1 from 12s, and Pulse Rate in two points, 12 to 1 from 14 to 1. Majestic Star goes to 14 to 1 from 12s, and Sacrilege also at 14 to 1, as is Hall Knight from 16s. Atlantic Boy is 16 to 1 from 14s. A Cannon King and King's Ride both at 20s, 25 to 1 bar those. Trotting down the old man of the party, the eight-year-old Baronet. He won it in 1978, with a tremendous feat if he could win it again, having missed a year. Uh, he's carrying nine stone three, gradually coming nicely into form. He beat Tender Heart by a head in rather a battle of tactics last Saturday at uh, Ascot. And there's very little in it at the weights between them this afternoon. Uh, before that, he'd run a good fifth to Kilroy Hawk at Doncaster. And way back in the early part of the season, he won. Uh, it was at Kempton, in fact, uh, when he won in great style that day, too. He's a winner of this race in 1978. So trying for a unique double, the eight-year-old Baronet number three. Number nine sideways on is Smoke Singer, one of the outsiders, a horse by Crooner. He's a five-year-old trained by Paul Kellaway here at Newmarket. He was six behind Welsh Chanter at Goodwood in the middle of September. Uh, Hall Knight was fourth. 
when he was third to Kempton at Moor Light, and on that one we certainly holds Hall Knight. Been had a fairly busy but unsuccessful this season this year. Number nine, Smoke Singer. Cardinal Flower with his back to us with that diamond. A coat by Sharp and Out out of Ixia, a three-year-old carrying eight stone two. Well, he was fourth at Wolverhampton when Cannon King beat On Edge, and they meet on the same terms here. So on that form, he appears to be fairly safely held. He was a winner himself at Yarmouth when he beat Royzer ahead. That's number 13, Cardinal Flower, trained by Gavin Pritchard Gordon here as his majestic star uh, at Newmarket. Number 13, Cardinal Flower. And I think we've seen them all, except for Pulse Strait. There he is, Pulse Strait number seven, Northern Challenger. Uh, this one is a gelding by Prince Tenderfoot, a four-year-old carrying eight stone ten, and an impressive air winner on soft ground over Amber Vale. That was his third run of the season, so he's hit form at the right time. Uh, whatever he does today, watch him over hurdles this winter. I'm sure he's going to be successful over hurdles. I think the problem with him today is the ground is a, a lot firm. He's got a tremendous stride on him. Whether he's got the ability to quicken, which you're going to have to have today when they go out of the dip, dip remains to be seen. Anyway, John Oakes, he thinks he has, so all uh, luck to number seven, Northern Challenger, Pulse Strait. Now, let's fill you in on the draw whilst they're milling around behind the stalls. Actually, before we do that, we've got more betting. More money for ten to heart, now four to one from nine to two. And Princess Gate is nine to one from tens. One Fleet Street at ten to one, and Easter Sun reverts to twelves. Pulse Rate and Sacrilege both at twelve to one. Majestic Star and Hall Knight at fourteens. Atlantic Boy sixteen to one. Cannon King and King's Ride both at twenties. Twenty-five to one bar those. So the money coming back on to uh, Tender Heart. Well, uh, the draw, first of all, are the ones drawn on the right on the inside. We've got Fine Blue drawn one, Cardinal Flower and Cannon King drawn on the inside. So those are the ones trying to make the best of their way up on the rails on this side. Whilst <coughs> right over on the far side, uh, we've got a, a group of quite reasonably fancied horses. You've got Easter Sun, uh, Smoke Singer, not so much, but anyway, Hall Knight is over there, as is Sacrilege and Paleo. And right over on the far side is the uh, drum S train by Gavin Pritchard Gordon. Uh, Favourite Tender Heart is drawn eight, so Joe Mercer's got to make a decision there as to whether to go with the group on this side or the group on the far side. It'll be very interesting to see what he uh, decides to do. That's uh, Sacrilege going round behind the stall, several more ready in. I've done a lot of waffling, so let's give uh, Graham Good a breather. Number 19, Sacrilege, one of Peter Warwin's two representatives, written this afternoon by young Nicky Howe, whose big success this season was on fine blue. on fine sun in the uh, John Smith magnet not fine blue fine blue in fact a runner here and for those of you who are looking in jockey Steve Cawthon has lost his cap coming down to the start on fine blue and so that one looks as if he's got a black cap the 13 is cardinal flower seven is pulse rate all night going in there you can see fine blue and Steve Cawthon just the crash helmet no cap and I think when fine blue is in that'll be about it for the William Hill Cambridgeshire Baronet still to go in. Princess Gate now 10 to 1 from 9 to 1. Fine Blue and Steve just about to go in. Fine Blue ran a corker in this race last year and relatively ignored in the betting. Don't know why. Baronet just about to go in. And these two will be the last in, I think. That looks Take about it. Off. All in. Take the blind off. They're all in, you heard. They're under orders and they're off. For the William Hill Cambridgeshire and very quickly into its stride is double meaning and that one leads from Majestic Star then just in behind these African Rhythm and with them Pulse Rate, Paleo and Sacrilege up on the outside and at the end of the first furlong and a half it's double meaning and Pulse Rate from Paleo and Sacrilege then right on the inside Princess Gate just in behind these comes African Rhythm they've completed a quarter of a mile and Paleo up on the outside right on the near side are double meaning and with double meaning Princess Gate. They've just got over six furlongs to go and it's Paleo up on the outside and double meaning. Then right on the near side is Cardinal Flower. African Rhythm right with them, improving his one Fleet Street. The back marker at this stage is Dromefs. They've just got under five furlongs to go and Paleo in the lead from Cardinal Flower over the John Penny. And just about uh, four furlongs still to go and on the far side Paleo up the centre Prince's Gate, African Rhythm on turn to lead us on the near side Double Mean and also Cannon King and Cardinal Flower. And so they have three and a half furlongs still to go and the lead still being disputed about Prince's Gate 
and then comes Pulse Ray come to join the leaders on the far side. So did a Sacra Janitsa Sun. And so they pass the three far on from home mark. A little acuity here between Pulse Ray, Sacra Janitsa Sun on the far side, on the near side. Then comes Majestic Star, and they come past the bushes on towards the final quarter mile. Lisa Sun on the far side, Sacrage and Pulse Rate. That's the leading three. Double meaning on the near scene. Cannon King also under pressure, so to his Cardinal Flower. They go down into the dip, and it's Pulse Rate and Lisa Sun battling it out. Then just behind them comes Baronet, also making a forward move to Atlantic Boy on the far side. Then comes Hall Knight. They pass the fur on from home marker. Lisa Sun now maintained on by Pulse Rate and Baronet on the near side. Atlantic Boy trying to come through on the far side. They got about 100 yards still to go, and it's Baronet now takes a fractional lead at the line, Baron had just been drawn mess for me and in third place, Pulse Rate, double meaning then comes Tender Heart, followed in by Fine Blue after that Atlantic Boy, Issa Sun and Fondo over a whole host including Prince's Gate and one of the last ones over a majestic star and so old Baronet who won this race back as a six year old has completed a unique double here although it has gone to a photo but that's the way I read it and if he has no eight year old has ever won it this century and so Baronet, who came and closed the gap in on the lead as they came inside that final quarter mile, then had a real good run through under Brian Rouse. And of course, Brian Rouse was also aboard Baronet when he won it in 1978 for Mr. F.A. Harris. And of course, Baronet still with the John Benstead stable. But that's the way I saw the race. Drum F's came out of the blue to chase him home and narrow the gap as we wait for the outcome of the photo. Let's see the replay with Ken Butler. And a tremendous chance. My selection, Cannon King, actually sli uh, slipping away on the inside there. Uh, you, uh, the favourite Tenderheart actually rather got get stopped in his run. I don't know if you could see him in the middle there. He, I don't think he would have got there, but he's just beginning to make his run. He seems to get stopped in his run, and that's the, as far as he's concerned, that's the end of it. Anyway, we got the winner coming through nicely. Atlantic Boy running very promptly on this side. The winner coming through very nicely in the middle. Peleo still going very, very well. That Drum F, who was actually plumbed last at one stage, is now making very far pro fast progress, actually behind Cannon King at that stage. I don't know how much further we've got to go at the moment. Meantime, We've got Baronet just about coming through to, to win his race here. Uh, Atlantic Boy battling on as hard as he can on the far side, on this side of him. Um, not quite sure what the one is, right over one but on the far side. But anyway, he's weakening out of it at this stage. Uh, John Meff's coming very, very fast and late on this side. Uh, <coughs> Tenderheart, you can see, is actually not in the first eight at that stage, never really getting much of a chance. Baronet sticking out his head. It's John Meff's on this side, is putting in the most challenge to him, but I think he's probably just holding on, Baronet, although he's absolutely dying on the line. We'll have to wait for the result of the photo. Uh, goodness knows what's third. It could possibly be Atlantic Boy. No, I, don't, I think possibly Atlantic Boy's third, John, but I'll throw that back, back to you. Uh, no, if we can just hold that freeze frame for the moment. It looks like Baronet on the far side, John Meff's finishing very fast on the near side. Pulse rate in third, then double meaning, followed by tender heart. <laughs> then on the near side, fine blue and Atlantic boy on the far side. And so a real blanket finish here for the William Hill Cambridge handicap. The heart in the Cambridgeshire at Newmarket means that the bookmakers of Britain have been saved a two and a half million pounds payout because that's what they were due to cough up had Tender Hart won his race and Al Q. Waite won next Saturday's second leg of the autumn double that totes Zarowich also at Newmarket. Well, Al Kuwait is still very much the favourite, and one of the reasons for that was this splendid victory at Newmarket in July. And the favourite Al Kuwait at the moment beginning to struggle perhaps a little bit in last place as they come now down to the final two furlongs. And Pat Edry asks Lee just to quicken again. Halen now going into second place, but here comes Al Kuwait with a run now. He looked to be struggling, but he's running on very strongly now as they race up out of a dip and meet the rising ground. And it's Lee just from Halen, and between these two comes Al Kuwait with a very strong looking but run couldn't quite uh, get through there but he's got through now and racing up towards the line as Lee just drops away it's going to be Alky Waite who's going to win it up the line coming up the line now Alky Waite is the winner back on Yes, victory for Al Kuwait, the favourite for Saturday's big race. But the burning question of the hour must be, will John Tyrrell tip him and ruin his chances forever, <laughs> or will he oppose him? Come on, John, what do you say? Al Kuwait or not? Oh, don't worry. John Sutcliffe and the Middle Eastern connection that only Al Kuwait can breathe again, I'm not going to go for him. Uh, he's uh, had one race since the one we've just seen. He was fourth then at Newmarket over 12 furlongs, a distance, of course, far too short for him, but a good prep race nonetheless. The ground is softening. I think he must have a great chance, but, of course, the odds are very cramped at 7-2 and this is a very bad race for favourites. But when we have got a talk about, I think, out of that race is Hylin. Only second there to Al Kuwait, but a winner of five of his seven races since that time. He's really badly handicapped, of course, as a result of all that success, but he's a great campaigner. The, the stable's in great form. They had a, a nice winner at Ascot on Saturday, and you can't really ignore his chance. 
But you're not tipping either of those in actual fact. And I think it's fair to say, and, and not cruel to say, that it is a week or two since uh, you did pick us a winner. So, <laughs> so <laughs> what's going to win the Cesarowicz on Saturday? It's a long time since I picked a winner on the flat, Fred. Yes, I don't know what it was called, but I know Gordon Richards wrote it. <laughs> yes, and I was 12 years old oh, at the time. That's <laughs> right. I was an apprentice, yes. I'm going for Potsy's Joy. I'm relying on the old maestro, Lester Pickett, to get me out of trouble. Not for the first time, I would add. Uh, this horse improved about a stone since last season, I think. A course winner in 1979, winner of five races this year, including his latest start, the Sportsman's Club Handicap at Sandown, back in August. A quarter of a mile still to go. Johnny still has the advantage, but Lester comes up on the outside on Potsy's Joy. These two are then leaving Francesco and Willie Cox as they run now towards the final furlong. It's Lester Pickett on the near side. Potsy's Joy, the fractional leader from Willie Carlson far side. Johnny, with the Cox, and then comes Francesco inside the final furlong. And it's Potsy's Joy just hanging a little bit there. And Johnny just had a switch, but I don't think it's going to make much difference to the result. As they come up towards the line, Potsy's Joy and Lester Pickett aboard. They're going to win the Sportsman Cup handicap and chase them home is John in second place. So Popsy's Joy then is your main selection, the one that's definitely going to win. But it's a it's a field that's really big enough, is it not, to have a couple of others to watch out for? So oh, what I think shall so. we look out for? Oh, sorry, yeah, four places in the frame to fill. And I'm going for Popaway as a second choice. A Harry Rag trained filly and could be really well handicapped, especially if the weights got about five pounds, and I think they probably will. Originally only given six stone nine in the long handicap, but she's won a race since the weights were published at Ripon in a very fast time. And later handicaps show that this horse really ought to have about fifteen pounds more. I reckon she'll carry about 7.4, including Bryn Crossley's apprentice allowance, and it should be about 7 stone 10, so this one could be well in, and Harry Rag is a great trainer of fillies, so one to watch. So that's Pop Away, right. Popsy's Joy, and one other very quickly. Athford, a good plodder, acts on any ground, and good form behind Hylian earlier this year. Handicap to reverse that running, and a good chance, I think, at 33 to 1. Now, it is fair to say we had uh, some success last winter, in fact, with Tyrrell's midweek winner running through the winter months over the sticks. In fact, £29 profit to a £1 stake, and that feature is, in fact, returning, is it not, to Southport? Yes, back on November the 10, and it's easier over the sticks. <laughs> it's got to be, isn't it? <laughs> I God so, bless yeah. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. So, just a reminder of John Tyrrell's three for the field for Saturday's big race, the Cesare Witch. They are... Popsy's Joy, that's his main selection, but also keep an eye out for Popaway and Athford. Well, finally, golf and that marvellous golf team. Leicester Pickett should win this on Spark of Life, in which uh, that great cricketer Colin Ingleby McKenzie has an interest. Karim has a possibility. Ramanoli, you may see, may have seen run with us up at Redcar, hung a bit that day on the firm ground, were much better suited by this. The winner gets six and a half thousand, plus a set of uh, these crystal uh, uh, carrot the canters and glasses are 500 pounds worth, a fantastic great thing beside me here. So, plenty to win, let's go and join them down at the start. Spark of Life, the uh, short price selection, an old pick at certainty we think. Let's join them with some betting first and then it's John Exie. And Spark of Life shows the five to four on favourite, Ramanelli at five to one, Spanish Bay and Neltino both at six to one, 12 to one bar four. And you're looking at Neltino leading down Lester Pickett on Spark of Life. I didn't know that uh, Colin Ingleby McKenzie has a share in this. I sincerely hope that Lester Pickett is going to win for him. I think he very likely will, because Spark of Life uh, has won his only two races, and the second one particularly easily. Admittedly, he only had some rather moderate rivals at York, but he absolutely hacked up from Maryland Cookie and had won with an awful lot in hand the time before that at Yarmouth. So that uh, there's every evidence that he was worth uh, his 32,000, uh, the 32,000 he cost. In fact, Spark of Life isn't in that picture. That's Spanish Bay, Spanish Bay on the right, uh, Himi, the one who hasn't run in the center. But I'll just go on briefly about Spark of Life. He's out of a, a, a mare who's ha a half-sister to Sparkler. She didn't actually run herself, but Sparkler, of course, was a real good horse and Spark of Life has certainly inherited a good deal of that ability. So that's number two, Spark of Life. We'll see him again presently. But coming across the picture now is Neltino, just going to the right of your picture in Lady Beaverbrook's colours. Well, uh, Dick Hearn seemed to think a good deal of Neltino because he thought enough of him anyway to run him in the Royal Lodge. But last time out in that race, he could only finish last, behind a long way behind Rob Bellino and recitation so you see how good a race it was because recitation of course has won the grand criterium in france since nevertheless neltino was no match for them whatever uh, he'd been favorite first time out and got beat by raza penang nevertheless has certainly shown some ability at west ilsley 
and the question is whether he can produce it on the race course. That's Neltino, and uh, <coughs> and uh, yes, in the just in the in the in the background there is Karim in the, in the colours of Prince Faisal. Peter Walwyn trains him for Prince Faisal, and he won his very first race uh, at Chester and in fact has won three times altogether at Lingfield and Haydock as well but he's also been beaten a couple of times had his limitations exposed as they say by uh, scintillating air for instance beat him quite a long way at York and uh, he ran rather disappointingly behind Tumbledown Hill so it'll be a little bit surprised to me if uh, Karim is good enough with top weight nine stone four the same as Spark of Life another look at the betting and Kareem has just come into the market at 12 to 1. Spark of Life still the 5 to 4 on favourite. Ramanelli steady at 5 to 1 and Spanish Bay at 6s. Neltino now goes to 7 to 1 from 6 to 1. Kareem at 12, 25 to 1 bar. Uh, there's uh, Himi who hasn't had a run. I gather there was a slight mix up at the beginning. I apologise for that. Apparently we lost a link there. Well, this is a filly by high top. Uh, hasn't run, but cost 50,000 guineas. Uh, Mr. Tiku owns her, Jeremy Hindley trains her. We shall see whether she's uh, as good as the money suggests. I badly want to see Ramanoli in number seven stall. Uh, could we find number seven Ramanoli? Uh, he's just gone into the stalls, John, already in number Thank seven. you. Well, he's a, a fascinating uh, horse. He cost 43,000 guineas, trained by Tom Jones for Robert Sangster. Apparently, he was very difficult to ride to begin with. Uh, awfully difficult to stop and steer and in his only race so far he was a very good third to spin drifter but Paul Cook who rode him had some difficulty riding him that day and in fact in the end had to drop his hands and concentrate on keeping him straight a lot of people thought that Ramanoli uh, hadn't tried too hard but in fact it was the difficulty of steering him that was Paul's problem interesting to see in. how he runs today but they're all in so over to you yes and uh, all out John and the first to come out of the stalls on the outside was Mark Oral who is followed in the early stages by Joss Kilton and Spanish Bay settling down in fourth towards the outside is Karim after Karim comes the so far unbeaten spark of life and the last three are Ramanoli and Eltino and another one just hidden which I can't identify the way it looks like the Philly Jaime it is it's Jaime the uh, only debutante in this field now they've gone just over a furlong and a half and still making it is Mark Oral from Spanish Bay and second spark of life has improved quite quickly Karim is also very prominent over on the far side and with that order back to you John Penny in the stands uh, Mark Oral continues to lead from Spanish Bay then comes spark of life on the outside is Jaime and so they're passing the halfway stage still a little to choose between Mark Oral on the far side then towards the center comes Spark of Life and Lester Pigger between those two, Paradise Bay, and then also make a run towards the outside is Ramanoli. So they pass the three fell on from home marker. Spark of Life now takes it up, but only fracturing from Paradise Bay. Then just to behind Spark of Life is Neltino. Then making a run towards the outside is Ramanoli. They pass the bushes on towards the final quarter mile, and it's Spark of Life and Lester Pigger now being taken on the far side by Alan Bond on Spanish Bay. Fell on a half still to go. Spanish Bay on the far side, and Spark of Life on the near side, who still has the advantage, but they're coming towards the final furlong and Paradise Bay now fights back and takes a fractional lead but Spark of Life is not done for he's taken to his job well on the near side but as they come out towards the line it's Spark of Life on the near side who may just fractionally beat Paradise Bay but a very very near thing then comes Neltino in front of Jaime Jaime's followed in by Kareem then comes Ramanoli and the last two are over the line the early leader Mark Oro and also just Kilton and of course a photo for that about a furlong and a half out I thought Spark of Life was absolutely going to cruise up but Alan Bond really worked at Spanish Bay and was a real threat through the closing stages and uh, in the end I think that effort has just been beaten because I think Spark of Life maybe has just survived that strong attack of number 10 but as they pull up on the far side and see them come back on the near side we have Spark of Life the Mount Lester Pigott and Romanali on the far side so as they come back to the paddock let's see the closing stages once again with John Oxy. Well, the thing to remember is that Spark of Life is giving £12 to Spanish Bay, who'd been uh, third in both his races, had quite reasonable form. Nevertheless, I agree with John Penny. Here, it looks as though the maestro has another easy victory on his hands. Lester sitting pretty motionless, just nudging with his hands at the furlong pole. But Alan Bond, who's going to have some important rides in the next two days, gets every ounce out of Spanish Bay and probably just gets his head in front for a moment. I would say that in a moment you'll see Lester's pulled his whip through to the left of left hand gives spark of life a sharp tap and that has i think the desired re desired result 
as you see. Spark of life certainly appears from our picture to have poked his no head nose in front there, in front of Spanish Bay, keeps it there to the line, I would say, as one by at least a head, but uh, you never can tell. And Spanish Bay has certainly run a fine race in second place. And so we wait for the outcome of the photo. Is it number two, Spark of Life, or is it number 10, Spanish Bay? And certainly looking at the replay, I once again stand by my opinion that possibly Spark of Life has possibly just survived. Stride along, but um, it all depends. Okay. Well, you've seen him, you've seen Teogori Mu, you've seen all the others around. What do you think? A final thought? Well, my final thought is that um, to end the day anyway, I would say Stormbird. Um, to Agori Mu, as you said, it might be a bit deep for him. He's a big, long striding horse, and he might just get beat to the punch. Well, Steve, you were the punch last time. We'll watch it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Steve Cawthon, who actually rode Stormbird last time out. Well, a tremendous chance now for this Stormbird to fill his advance billing, and it's a fascinating race, and I, I too, think that he'll be too good for them. But To Agori Mu is a, a real test. So are the others. Let's go and join John Oxy with this, the running of the Dewhurst Stakes. And there he is, the cynosure of all eyes, Stormbird. Just a nice round sum he cost as a yearling, $1 million. Perfectly straightforward sum, and no surprise, because he's by the most successful sire in the world, Northern Dancer, and out of a mare who has already produced some very good fillies. She herself won the Canadian Oaks, and she produced a flying two-year-old called Ocean's Answer in 1978. Well, as you know, Stormbird, who in the moment is going to go behind that awful brick wall, which is a nuisance to us, uh, is unbeaten in four races. The trouble is that we really can't measure his ability through the horses he's beaten, because uh, Prince Echo and Band Practice, uh, the last two horses he's beaten in Ireland, have both come over here, and they've both been well beaten. Prince Echo couldn't beat Gielgud at Doncaster, and Band Practice only finished fourth to Matterboy uh, in, and Bell Bolide in the William Hill Middle Park. So that uh, although, of course, Stormbird beat those horses easily, they haven't exactly paid him any compliments when they've come to this country. So now he's got to do it for himself, and uh, Pat Edery has the chance, his first chance, in Robert Sangster's colours in this country, although I don't need to tell you how well he took his chance on Detroit in the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. Well, there was Stormbird, and here, surely, is the biggest danger. I don't know about Shirley, maybe Centurius would be as good, bigger danger, but this is Toagori Mu, which means uh, my boy, he is named, he's Mrs. Audrey Muinos, his owner, has only named two horses. One was Elamana Mu, and the other was Toagori Mu. Of course, she sold Elamana Mu, to Lord Weinstock, and uh, a very successful purchase that turned out to be. But, brilliantly, Guy Harwood had managed, in the meanwhile, to buy her a suitable replacement. He paid 20,000 guineas for Toa Gori Mu, who's very unfashionably bred, exactly the opposite of Stormbird in that respect. He's by Tudor Music, out of a mare by Cracksman, and in fact his dam, believe it or not, won over hurdles so that it's by no means a sort of Keeneland pedigree, but what it's produced, as you can see, is a big, strong, resolute colt. And he gallops the way he looks. He's won his last three races. He, too, uh, wasn't paid... Yes, I beg your pardon, he has beaten a good horse, because Clear Verdict, who admittedly, he met Clear Verdict when Clear Verdict was having his first run, but Toragori Mu beat him pretty comfortably, and since then, Clear Verdict has won both his races, and in the last of them, he beat Recitation. And Recitation then went over to France and won the Grand Criterium. So that by that measurement, Toa Gori Mu's form is first rate. He's also a stable companion of Recitation. And Guy Harwood has always made no secret of the fact that this fellow is well in front of the Grand Criterium winner. So, as Bruff says, this is without doubt the two-year-old championship of Europe, and you're looking at the back view of Greville Starkey on probably England's most hopeful candidate, Toa Gori Mu. And now here is Lester Piggott in the henbit colours of Mrs. Etty Plesch. Miss Waki, who was trained, of course, by Francois Boutin, 
in France. He only cost a mere $150,000. Uh, not nearly as much as Northern Dancer, although it might seem quite a lot to you and me. And no surprise that he cost that. Well, I suppose you might have expected him to cost more because he too is uh, uh, very well bred. His dams produced numerous winners over in uh, America. And Miss Swaki has soon proved well worth the money. He won first time out uh, the Yakolev at Deauville, uh, won it by six lengths very easily indeed. Then he got beat. He got beat by a filly, in fact, an ancient, ancient regime, who in, had herself been beaten at Royal Ascot in the Queen Mary stakes. But uh, since then, Miss Waki met ancient regime again uh, in the pre-morning at Deauville, and he won that seven furlong race uh, really well, staying on towards the end to beat Prince Mab with ancient regi regime well behind so that he represents the best of the French two-year-old form. Stormbird certainly represents the best of the Irish, and Toa Gori represents the best of the English. Let's see what the bookies think about it. Um, Miss Waki shares at six to one in the betting, but Stormbird, the favorite, just gone to five to four on, from 11 to 10 on, having opened at even money. Toa Gori Moo is three to one from five to two. Centurious, 11 to two from five to one. Miss Waki at sixes and Kirtling, the outsider, 20 to 1, having opened the 25s, all five show. And now from Lingfield, the SP of the 3-5, first number 9 sweeping along at 9 to 1, second number 8 straight, Jocelyn, 9 to 2, and third number 3, Nadabini, also at 9 to 2. Diamond Edge, the 2 to 1 on favourite, unseated his rider, and 4 round. Well, I'm glad to see that straight Jocelyn's got round, but uh, this is Centurious, the full brother to the great Grundy, he cost 270,000 guineas as a yearling, and he too has lost no time in proving himself well worth the money. He was just beaten first time out, ran really well in fact at Sandown, beaten by Carla Glow, a uh, stable companion of Toa Gori Moo and Recitation, trained like them by Guy Harwood. But Centurius ran really well that day, and next time at Ascot, uh, ridden by Walter Swinburne Jr., who you've just heard talking about him, he put up an extraordinarily smooth and accomplished performance. So did Walter, because he looked to be very short of daylight a furlong out, but he didn't get in any kind of a flap. In fact, he sat cool as ice, just gave Centurius the office, cruised through and was patting his neck as they went across the line. It was a very cool performance by the boy and by the horse, but we don't really know what the form amounts to. Uh, Priory Lane, who was fourth in that race, didn't run very well yesterday, didn't pay Centurius any compliments. I have no doubt that this is a, a good colt, but just possibly, I suppose this race may come plenty early enough in his career compared with the more experienced Stormbird, Turgori Moo and Miss Waki. Nevertheless, a full brother to a, a great horse, Grundy, a horse with a future, number one, Centurious, was ridden today by Alan Bond because of the injury to Walter Swinburne. Now the betting. Centurious easing in the market now, 6 to 1 from 11 to 2. Stormbird the favourites, 5 to 4 on. To Oguri Mu out to 7 to 2 from 3 to 1. Centurious at 6s. Miss Waki also at 6s. Kirtling 20 to 1, all 5 show. And there's, there's uh, Kirtling, the mount of Willie Carson, uh, trained by Harry Rag for Mr. Moller. Uh, and Kirtling is by Grundy, a son of Centurious's great half brother. And uh, he looked early in his two-year-old career, in fact, in his second race, he uh, did something nobody else has done because he beat Rob Alino in the Chesham Stakes at Ascot, only just, but beat him fair and square. And Rob Alino has since then proved himself right up at the very top flight of the English two-year-olds. Unfortunately, Kirkling's only other run was comparatively disappointing. He was beaten himself. He never could, never really going like a winner in the Laurent Perrier Champagne at Doncaster. Uh, he was off the bit a long way out and in the end uh, finished nearly three lengths behind Gielgud, who as you know is a non-runner today, but uh, who doesn't really appear to be absolutely top class form. So Kirtling has something to find. Stormbird, who you see in the middle of the picture, has something to prove. Centurious and Alan Bond are also on trial. And Toa Gori, though, there's Lester being loaded up with Miss Waki. Sure to be staying on towards the end. He's, his last victory was over seven furlongs. In he goes, 
And I think that leaves Toa Gori Moo, doesn't it, John? Yes, it does, uh, John. He'll be the last of the quintet to go in. What a good-looking horse. Just look at the, the power in that frame. He is a very long-striding horse, but there they are, all in. Good luck to them. Over to you, John. And they're under orders, and they're on their way. And the five break out on an even basis, but it's Toa Gori Moo, the fractional leader, from Kirtling on the far side. Then Pat Hedrick can tend to sit just in behind them with Stormbird. Then comes Miss Waki running very freely and Centurious. So they run a furlong. Drebel Starkey on Toa Gori Moo continues to lead from Stormbird on the near side, Kirtling on the far side. Then just in behind them comes Miss Waki on the far side of Centurious. And so they've covered about two furlongs. And the order still very much the same. Toa Gorimu in the lead from Stormbird, the white cap on the near side. Then just in behind them then comes Miss Waki with on the near side Centurious and on the far side Kirtling. And now Stormbird right up on side. In fact, a fractional leader at this point. And so with Stormbird, a fractional leader from Toa Gorimu, Kirtling on the far side. Then comes Miss Waki and Centurious. The five runners closely grouped up together and going well within themselves. That's the order back to Raleigh in the grandstand. Well, they're just past halfway and it's Stormbird for Ireland in the lead from the long-time leader to Gori Moo's second but here comes Ms. Waki for France just behind them and over on the far side the line is uh, the extreme outside of Kirtling at the moment last of the five is Centurius a 61 shot but now the battle really on between Pat Edry on Stormbird and the white cap over on the far side Greville Starkey on Toa Gori Moo at the distance now these two have gone clear of the rest Ms. Waki in third but he's got no chance with the first two are locked in a desperate struggle racing up towards the lines just Stormbird from Toa Gori Moo the lonely down neck and it also half a length perhaps Stormbird's got to win it at the line Stormbird wins the new house. Toa Gori Moo second, and these two finish well clear of Mizwaki third, Kirtling fourth, and Centurious fifth. So they were right, this fellow is a good horse. How good remains to be seen, but he remains unbeaten. Stormbird it was, who was always a strong favorite for this race. Stormbird, who was unbeaten before coming here today, as were Vincent O'Brien's five previous Dewhurst winners when they contested this race. They were, of course, Nijinsky, who won the Triple Crown, the last horse to do so, Cellini, the minstrel, Try My Best, and Monteverdi. So there he is, up on the horizon, the, the first million-dollar yearling purchase to be seen racing in England, just pulling up at the top of the hill, so Pat Edry continues his triumphant ways in the Sangster colours, having won the arc on the Philly Detroit. Let's see him now, winning the Dewhurst again, in replay this time, described by John Oxy. And without much doubt, these are two good horses, and one is slightly better than the other. I don't think they've gone a very great gallop. It'll be interesting to see the time. But as you can see, Toa Gori Moo is the first to come under pressure. Miss Waki behind them is already beaten. From here, it's a match, and Stormbird is always just winning it. Pat Edry, as you see, does pick up his whip, gives Stormbird just three light slaps with his left hand. Now he puts it down. He feels confident enough to do that and well though Toa Gori Moo has run on to the end and keeps running on to the end nevertheless there's no doubt that Stormbird has won strictly on merit I've just heard incidentally that there's a steward's inquiry believe it or not we of course can't see uh, how close the two were together as they raced home I suppose it's just possible that they did come close together no deviation was visible from where from uh, on my monitor certainly uh, it'll be very interesting to know what the reason for the stewards inquiry is. certainly Stormbird didn't appear to uh, deviate like Monteverdi let's have another look if we can uh, could we see it again yes we can now you see at this moment there certainly there's a good there's good uh, daylight between the two horses but uh, Braff who's in better view fr from me rather thinks that Stormbird may have gone over towards Toa Gori Moo and now you come to look at it they do now at this stage look a little bit closer together Toa Gori Moo appears to be running home perfectly straight uh, Pat Edry has got the whip in his left hand which strictly speaking is the wrong hand because he ought to have the whip between him and Toa Gori Moo but as I say on this film you certainly wouldn't say that there was any deviation certainly no sign of a bump but just uh, I think we can show uh, a head-on shot or yes we can indeed that's now, now then let's see let's see what this shows the first time I've seen this uh, clear daylight between them at this moment but his, this is where Pat uses his whip in his left hand I suppose just possibly the gap does close maybe Stormbird did go a little bit over to his right but I must say you wouldn't see from say from that picture that he's interfered with Toa Gori Moo however the stewards have a much more direct head-on shot 
uh, which will give them every conceivable chance to decide whether anything's gone wrong. I must say, looking at that, I'd be a little bit surprised if anything does. And the result, if it stands, the result of the William Hill Dewhurst Stakes, 1980. It's first, number nine, Stormbird, bred in Canada by Mr. Eddie Taylor, owned by Mr. Robert Sangster, trained at Ballydoyle, Cashel, County Tipperary, Ireland, by Vincent O'Brien, and ridden by Pat Edry. So Pat has won the Dewhurst for the third time. His previous wins were with lunchtime in 1972 and then the great Grundy two years later. Second was number 10, Toogori Moo, owned by Mrs. Andrew Muinos, bred by the Rathduff Stud, trained by Guy Harwood and ridden by Greville Starkey. And third, number five for France, Mizwaki, owned by Madame Etty Plesch, bred by Bruce Campbell and the early bird stud in America, trained by Francois Boutin and ridden by Lester Piggott. So, Stormbird Judy does win the Dewhurst. We'll bring you, of course, the results of this Tuesday's inquiry as soon as, as soon as we have it. But leave you with the thought that uh, Ter Gorimu is the bigger. Maybe he will grow to be stronger next year. The issue is not perhaps yet over. But it's the biggest race of the two-year-old calendar, and it was a great one. Nice to see you. See you tomorrow. Fast on the outside is Pratik with recitation. On the wide outside is Dumphy. A foul on the half to go, and it's Presta Rider coming to challenge Great Substance. Coming fast on the outside still of Pratik and recitation. Pratik and recitation taking it up now from Presta Rider, and Dumphy is finishing well with 50 yards to go. It's Pratik and recitation with Dumphy finishing fast. But at the line, it's a photo between recitation and Pratik. Dumphy is third. And recitation won it by a short head to give Britain only our second success since the war in that race. And on the face of it, a bad result for the French because both the first and second there are inferior to their stable companions who ran in the Dewhurst Stakes yesterday. But Francois Boutin told me yesterday that in his view, Cresta Rider hadn't run his race. He was sluggish after the race. He had his head down. And in his view, he could still be a crack. Well, from the world of million-pound horses down to racing at its grassroots here at uh, Bangron D, this popular national hunt course on the North Wales borders. And here our first race is the Sporting Chronicle Handicap Hurdle, for which there are three non-runners. The non-runners are number 21, Dingbat, number 24, Go Free, and number 35. But a fractional leader from Turgori Moo, curtling on the far side, then comes Miswagi and Centuris, the five runners closely grouped up together and going well within themselves. That's the order, back to Raleigh in the grandstand. Well, they're just past halfway, and it's Stormbird for Ireland in the lead from the long-time leader, Turgori Moo, second, but here comes Miswagi for France just behind them, and over on the far side, belying his odds, the extreme outsider, Kirtling, at the moment last of the five is Centuris, the 61 shot, but now the battle really on between Pat Edry on Stormbird and the White Cup over on the far side, Greville Starkey on Toa Gori Moo at the distance now. These two have gone clear of the rest. Mizwaki in third, but he's got no chance. With the first two are locked in a desperate struggle and racing up towards the lines, just Stormbird from Toa Gori Moo. The lonely down neck and it also half a length perhaps. Stormbird's got to win it at the line. Stormbird wins the new house. It's very hard to, for a race to live up to its advanced publicity. We all said that this was going to be the two-year-old clash of the season, and it really turned out to be like that. The two horses really came away from the, the third horse, and that's a very good sign. And both Turgori Moo and, and, and a Stormbird, I think, are very good horses indeed. And it's interesting, I don't think the issue is finished at all yet, because Turgori Moo, a bit the bigger horse, and more scope about him, he just might be able to... Uh, to cope with Stormbird over a longer trip. But don't let's take it away. The winner on the day was Stormbird. He was just the quicker, just the, the faster horse. And he goes into, into the winter as the undoubted two-year-old champion of Europe. And looking forward to seeing him in the 2000 Guineas next year will be one of the joys of the winter. But on now to this Cesarewicz. A different deal altogether. Two and a quarter miles for uh, much more experienced horses. One of the great sloggy matches of the season. 27 runners, all as in the morning paper. A few overweights I'll give you as we get to them. You can go for uh, many different ones here. The bottom horses have been a bit uh, squeezed down because uh, horses were left in at the top, and that means that 11 of them are carrying uh, well above their official handicap weight, including the bottom one, Gold Claim, who's carrying no less than two stone 11, or that he should be. Should be a uh, four stone 10 officially, and actually only carrying, uh, carrying uh, seven stone seven. I'm actually going here for Angelo Salvini. The ground, again, not quite soft enough, perhaps, for him, the way he won at, uh, at air. I like the way he did it then, he's in form, and uh, so is his jockey Sean Payne. I think he'll go very, he'll go very, very close. I'm frightened of Leicester on Popsy's Joy, 
Hylian, you mustn't count out of it. And John Cherry is sure to be thereabouts as well. That's four against the field. I go for Angelo Salvini. Let's see what the others think. Well, six go for Al Kuwait, who's a hot favourite in all the anti postists And frankly, just to be difficult, I don't give him any chance at all. He's not a horse for me for the Cesarewitch, but we'll see. Very experienced connections, I think he is. So we're in against each other. Angelo Salvini, five go for. Four go for the Philly Popaway, who hasn't won more than a mile and a half. Three for John Cherry, who won it three years ago. Two for an upper generation from Guy Harwood Stable. Two for Atford in the Master Willie Colours. Two for Hyde, who's already won eighth this season. And one for navigational aid with blinkers on for the first time. And here's the betting. And Al Kuwait shows the favourite, nine to two. Foxy's Joy, Highland, and another generation, all at ten to one. Pop away and get stone, both at 12s. John Cherry, Angelo Salvini, and Navigational Aid all show at 16 to 1. Sir Michael, Athford, and Monsbo, and Singing Armour all at 20s. High Old Time and Halber both at 25 to 1. Sharp, Vicomp, and Morgan's Pearl at 33 to 1, and 50s bar. Two and a quarter miles and uh... 27 of them making the long way down. A few overweights we've got for you. Lester puts up one pound overweight on Popsy's Joy. The ground dried up to uh, give him a tremendous chance at 8.6. Bruce Raymond has one pound overweight on Chateau Royale's interesting horse. Won the Iris Cesarewitch uh, two years ago and uh, only run twice this season. He could be a possibility. One over on him. Mickey Connaughton can't claim more than one pound his allowance on navigational aid at 7.6 there. Alan Mercer can only can, it has it 7-6 rather than 7-7 seven, seven. and uh, down the bottom uh, Ian Jenkinson on gold claim carries 7-8 so that makes two stone 12 pounds overweight for gold claim if you want to back it with me you uh, uh, can help yourselves there they are cantering down and the first time we see is high old time from uh, high old time from uh, Stamella's yard one last time out of Haydock and that was over a mile and a half and hasn't won more than a mile and a half. Surprising to me if uh, can win it can win here, but uh, surprises are what horse racing is all about. And uh, quite a lot of people are going to be wrong about this uh, about this uh, Zarowicz if uh, one or two of these horses win, because we've got quite a lot of horses who haven't been tested over the full distance. And two and a quarter miles with a lot of runners and several lightweights who are going to go off in a million miles an hour is going to take a hell of a lot of getting. It really is. Horses beginning to process down. And uh, I can see Miguelito with his red cap over on the far right. But uh, let's just talk briefly about John Cherry, the top one. John Cherry, who won this race back in 1976. Nine, nine stone nine he carries John Cherry. And he's won the best turned out horse award. His lad, Colin Richards, has won 50 pounds, turned out best turned out horse award. And he did look marvelous, uh, John Cherry. Ridden by Paul Cook. Was ridden when he won by Lester Piggott. But he's a horse who you saw win an amateur riders race at Ayr um, only about uh, two or three weeks ago. That should have put him really right for this race. He really stays the trip, and it's a, it's a truism, but a very important one, that horse, horses have really got to stay to win this. Incidentally, on the far right of that lot is Miguelito at the back of those. Miguelito, who ran a good race in this race last year and finished fifth, ridden by Paul Ellery today, fifth last year. He was third to Angelo Salvini, too, last time. He's a horse who will be slugging on at the finish, but uh, one would have thought that one or two of the others would have a little bit more class and the legs of him at the finish. So, could be thereabouts if we backed him. I'm surprised if he's capable of winning him. And there's a, a famous pair of colours this season. That's Hylin and Richard Fox. What a wonderful partnership they've had this season. Hylin, perhaps the greatest to tribute along with more style to any trainer more style for Robert Armstrong Highland for David Ellsworth won eight races this season he keeps on winning and uh, he got beat last time which is a sort of <laughs> great event when Highland actually gets beaten I ran a very good race there at Ascot and uh, would have put him right hopefully for this race David Ellsworth has been just slightly uh, um, more pessimistic than he normally is saying well maybe maybe the horse has had enough of a season but even though he's worse handicapped with a lot of his victims here, he's had a whole lot of horses behind him. Athford behind him, Avogational Aid behind him, Monsbo behind him, a Singing Amar behind him, Halber, another generation behind him this season. Although he's worse off with practically all of them, he's a horse, rather like John Cherry, who really stays this trip, really stays it well, and going to the last two furlongs, you almost for certain you're going to find Hylian cruising up to them. He has 
a bit of speed that comes very late, and uh, I think you'll find he's going to be thereabouts. If you backed him, you're lucky to get a great run for your money. Here's the full show of it. Harley still at 10 to 1, but Al Kiwet the favourite now 4 to 1 from 9 to 2. Pops is Joy, Highland, and another generation all at 10s. Pop away now 11 to 1 from 12s. Get stoned at 12 to 1. Angelo Salvini and Navigational Aid both come in two points, 14 to 1 from 16 to 1. And John Cherry steady at 16s, 20s bar. There is Highland, and the, on the far right, now that is uh, the favourite, the stripes of uh, Al Kuwait. Al Kuwait with the blinkers who um, is ridden by Taffy Thomas. He may win this, he may, w he may win Al Kuwait, but uh, I personally don't fancy him. Coming, walking towards us now with the cross belts. It's Mons Bow, just walked out of the picture. That actually, in fact, is Bossel. They have very similar stripes and blinkers as well. Bossel, whose chance is uh, infinitesimal on the book because he should have been carrying six stone four. He's actually carrying seven stone seven, but uh, he may do it. Surprises do happen, but I don't think it'll happen. Won, uh, won this year already, and twice, but uh, Colin Crossley does it. It'll be, a, it'll be a fine performance. Smokey Bear with the check colours going away from us. One of the two runners for Jack Hansen's stable. And the one, in fact, I fancy less of the two, even though he's won four races this season. He went to the sales last week, early this week on Monday, let out unsold. And the other one of the two handsome runners, Chateau Royale, has only run twice this season. He could be coming into form, and I think he's a possibility. 26 walking across there. There's Angelo Salvini walking to the right, those pink colours. You swing to the right, you'll see Angelo Salvini there with that O on them. Angelo Salvini, the O of Mr. Phil Bull. A horse who won last time out of the air, and a special quiz. Why do you think he's called Angelo Salvini? He's a Renaissance painter, perhaps he's an Italian sculptor. The answer is no, he's the head waiter of the George Hotel in Hackercate. That's where Angelo Salvini came, and this is a pretty good uh, tribute for anyone's name. He's uh, won five races this season for Peter Easterby, and he's in winning form at the moment, and Sean Payne is the jockey who last week clinched the Crown Plus Two Decorators Championship. And now, uh, walking through, if you walk through there, four is Hylian again seen here walking you just see Richard Fox's head as Harling walks away from us the uh, you go that to the left there there's blue colors there number five that's uh, see there five that is Sir Michael Sir Michael who is last year's winner the ground are much firmer it is today interesting to see if he can actually manage it I personally don't think he will but uh, if the ground had stayed firm, I could have fancied him a lot. He did win last time out in an apprentice's race at uh, Ascot, over a mile and a half, and uh, trainer Jeff Huffer has the tremendous advantage of knowing he's got a horse that uh, has already won this race. He's got him tuned. 24 is an interesting runner there. 24, that's Pop Away. A filly who's won her last two, and uh, over a mile and a half only, but much fancied by some people here at Newmarket. Did a brilliant gallop last week, and uh, some of the... Uh, the form money goes with her. If you go to the left a bit, you'll see Willie Carson's mount. To the left of that O, further to the left, you'll see Willie Carson just walking around the back there. Willie Carson on number seven gets stoned. He's a horse who won a mile and a half last time out, but uh, some connections are very confident that this one will stay the trip, and if it does well, it must go very close. But you see, to go from a mile and a half to two and a quarter miles uh, and in a fast run race that this normally is, is very, very hard work indeed. Coming towards us there, Willie Carson. Uh, walking through on the right, that's Gold Claim. I said, it was an extreme outsider. And uh, very surprising if that can play any part. John Cherry, he's at the back there with the, with the nose band. We've seen, talked about him, but on number two there is John Cherry, who won four years ago and is a tremendous horse at his best. 20 going through his high old time, we've talked about him. That's Willie Carson and Angelo Salvini. Going in through AT, navigational A, that's an interesting one. Go to the right, just go to the right a bit. That is with the check colours, that's number 18, navigational aid. Written by Nicky Norton for his master, Bill Watts. Bill, whose mountain call ran so tremendously uh, close here and uh, would dearly love to win this handicap. A horse who's got a perfectly good chance. 
He's uh, won two of his six races. He's got blinkers on for the first time, so could just put him there. The other one blinkers on first time. Vicomte has a chance, but navigational aid could go very close. Walking towards us now is Popsy's Joy with that, that uh, stripe across him, that black band across him. Popsy's Joy with Lester Piggott on board. Some people don't think he'll quite stay out this two and a quarter of miles. I think he will. Remember, the owner won this race with Ocean King back in 74, and would dearly love to win with Popsy's Joy, who's uh, from a man he bred himself. And Lester booked himself for this ride when uh, trainer Mick Haynes got to York. The day the weights came out, Lester said in his uh, immaculate mutter, he said, I'll, uh, I'll ride that for you. And he can do just uh, one pound overweight, eight stone six. More betting. And Popsy's Joy is in the market at 10 to 1, but Al Kuwait now 7 to 2 from fours, having opened at 9 to 2. Another generation at 10 to 1 with Popsy's Joy. Pop away 11 to 1 from 12s. And Hylian goes out to 12 to 1 from 10 to 1. Get stoned also at 12s. Angelo Salvini, Navigational Aid, and John Cherry all show at 14 to 1. Sir Michael, Athford, Monsbo, and Singing Armour at 20s. High Old Time and Halber both at 25 to 1. Sharp, Morgan's Pearl, Chateau Royal in the betting for the first time at 33 to 1, and Vcom at 40s, 50s bar. And there walking along is, is Pop Away on the left of your picture. And 21 there is Leo de Grange, written by Michael Hills. Leo de Grange been running over hurdles as well as on the flat. This year failed to collect and I uh, be very surprised if Leo de Grange is quite, uh, quite good enough, to be quite honest. We need to load up now. Al Kuwait, a very warmly supported favourite, but I must say, he's not, to me, the sort of horse of the winners is Arrowage. That'll be the fascination about it. Dave Vick, who's an enormously experienced man and who manages the horse, and John Sutcliffe is his trainer, are convinced he's, it could even be a cup, cup horse next year. But uh, he's over right at the back there. There's yellow and black stride. That's Al Kuwait, standing very calmly there, far left there. I don't personally think he's quite a, a tough enough sort of horse for this. He won first time out of the blinkers. We saw him win the, at the July horse meeting over a mile and a half here. He ran on the nicely, I'm not exactly vigorous driving from the taffy that day. And no doubt he'll be much better for that race. But uh, it's a bit of a, a pitiless slogging match. Horses who win this tend to be pretty tough and resolute. He's shown talent, Al Kuwait, but as yet, there is a slight question mark about his uh, long, hard slogging quality. And to me, to me, he's a million. <laughs> we'll see. Seven to do for him, but I don't. Uh, I don't fancy him. So there, there we are. At the back there, see those green colours of Morgan's Pearl. There's Morgan's Pearl. It's all one here on Thursday, and theory shouldn't have any chance because should be carrying six stone four and has a seven stone seven in the weights. But uh, Bill O'Gorman's got the horse in tremendous form, and uh, I can see it running very prominently despite the uh, fault in the weight differences. Well, remember, this is two and a quarter miles. It needs to actually communicate throughout a race. We're going to need three commentators to get us along. John Penny here for the final climactic closing stages. Rawley Gilbert through the middle of the race. And uh, down at the start, it'll be Ken Granger. Before we join Ken, just a quick look at Athford there walking in. Athford in the Master Willie colours, number 16. We're running really consistently this, re this season. And uh, well handicapped with Hylian. Slogs away, stays well, could be there. Let's go and join Ken now for the start of the Cesarewitch. And we have just vaguely James, who's always one of the last to go in. He gets very unhappy when he's locked in the stall. And also Al Kuwait, who's uh, another one who's not too keen on stalls, and he's usually put in last. So just a couple to go in now. The others all in uh, pretty good in order. All appear to be standing very quietly indeed. There's Al Kuwait, who's uh, slightly right of centre as we look at them, and uh, I think he's almost in. And indeed, the last of them just about to go in now, I think. And they're off, they're running, and they come out to a very even break. And in fact, Vaguely James was one of the first to show this one on the uh, camera side as they come towards us. Also, uh, Angelo Salvini, this one was well away and on the inside. And also just after these, and in fact now making the running is Smokey Bear. 
So they start to uh, settle down at the end of the first furlong. Smokey Bear from Angelo Salvini. Athford has moved up into third place. Just after these comes Hylin and Vicont on the inside. Lee Boy on the outside and also with these Gold Claim. After Gold Claim, Al Kuwait, who got away well. And they go down towards the end of the first three furlongs now with Smokey Bear taking them along and setting quite a good gallop. This one by some five, six lengths from Angelo Salvini. Alf Athford on the inside is close up. After these are v Vicont and Lee Boy. After Lee Boy is Monsbo, who's made a place or two, but over to Rolly Gilbert now, and with Smokey Bear setting the pace. Yes, Smokey Bear still setting the pace and well clear at the moment of the other 26 are headed in second place by Athford. Together with Athford is Angelo Salvini. Then comes the favorite Al Kuwait, who's made a forward move. Still there amongst the leaders is Gold Claim. After Gold Claim comes Liboy, then Vicont making ground behind Vicont is Leo de Grance. Then Navigation Aid, after Navigation Aid comes Monsburg, and then Hylin. After Hylin is High Old Time, and then comes John Cherry, the 1976 winner. And after him is Vaguely James, and then comes Sharp. Behind Sharp is Bossall, and then Sir Michael, who won it last year, and then Carver's Cora. Topsy's Joy is last but four, and the last uh, four, in fact, are uh, Get Stoned and uh, Chateau Royal, and the final two, who are Miguelito, and last of all is another generation. Now, they're making the turn towards the last mile and a quarter in the Cesarewitch, and as they come now towards the last straight, it's nine furlongs to go now, just about at halfway, and it's still Smokey Bear out in front, but Athford and Algino Salvini have closed right up. These are the first three. Four is Vicont, and five now the improving Miguelito. After Miguelito comes Liboy. Behind Liboy is the favorite Al Kuwait going well. Then pop away John Cherry Monsbo and Leo de Grance. And they come now towards the final seven furlongs of the Cesarewitch. It's still Smokey Bear for the north, who's made all the running so far. Athford a clear second in third place is Miguelito. Then four Vicont, five Angelo Salvini, six pop away. And then after these seven is navigation laid. And then comes John Cherry, followed by Popsy's Joy, who's made an awful lot of ground. Then the favorite Al Kuwait as they go under the six furlong marker, where the back markers in the Cesarewitch which are Sharp, Navigation Aid, who's got no chance. He's last but two, and the final two are Vaguely James, and last of all, Dorothy Squires' horse gold claim. And it's still Smokey Bear, under the five, who is in the lead, in the Cesarewitch, followed by Athford second, and then comes Pop away, and Pops is joy going awfully well. Then comes last year's winner, Sir Michael, and with that order, back to you, John, in the stands. And Smokey Bear still has the advantage. They come now towards the final four furlongs from Athford on the outside, then comes Pop away, then Miguelito just in behind the leading four, then comes Pops is and then coming right, right up to join us Miguelito, then comes Popsy's Joy, behind Popsy's Joy is, is Chateau Royal, then after then comes Get Stone, and so they pass the two final from home marker, pop away now in the lead, but Lester Pickett going very smoothly on Popsy's Joy in second place, and they come now to the last well on a half, and it's Lester Pickett on the outside, Popsy's Joy, pop away on the far side, that's the leading two, and so they pass the final from home marker, and it's Popsy's Joy and Lester Pickett in the lead from pop away in second place, then comes after in third, as they come up towards the line, pop Popsy's Joy late in his stride, goes away to win the Dope to Darrowitch from Pop away in second place. Then comes Athwood over in third, followed by Chateau Royal, and then comes Mekalito, Morgan's Pearl, Vogel's Pearl, followed him by Smokey Bear. Ailing comes next, John Cherry, then comes Carver's Cora, Beacon, High Old Time, Bond's Bow, Get Stoned, and they still continue over the line. In fact, the last two or three over include Gold Claim. And finally, the last one over is number 27, Vaguely James. And Popsy's Joy was always travelling well through that final half mile, just in behind the leaders. And once Lester produced her to take it up, he really ran to this stride and ran away to win it on the bridle, as it turned out to be, in the end. And so Popsy's Joy has given Mr Victor Morley Lawson his second success in the Cesaro, which he won it back in 1974 with Ocean King and like Ocean King was trained by Michael Haynes and Lester Pickett, the winning jockey today, he having won it twice before in 68 on Major Rose and 76 on John Cherry. And so the numbers now in the frame, second is number 24, Pop Away, owned by Mr. Eric Moller, trained by Harry Rag and ridden by Bryn Crossley. And third was number 16, Athford, owned by Mr. William Barnett, trained by Henry Candy and ridden by Billy Nunes. And fourth home was number nine, Chateau Royal, from the Jack Hansen stable. And in so has picked up just over a thousand and a half by finishing fourth. But a very easy win, which we can highlight once again as a rejoin, Brascott.
and the game in the Cesare, which is patience, and there's nobody more patient than Lester Piggott. He's cruised and kept Popsy's Joy up behind. Pop away, struck for home, and Bryn Crossley trying to make advantage of her weight difference. She struck for home ga gallantly. Bryn, who a, was a mountain climber before he became a, an apprentice jockey, he struck for home, but uh, Lester's always uh, kept something with Popsy's Joy. This horse come up from Epsom for Mick Haynes' stable, and he's come sweeping away. Lester Piggott wins his third Cesare, which wins it in impressive style for a, a man who rode his first winner when he was 67 years old, so a gallant win there, Atford his third, and uh, it was Chateau Royal who ran on to be fourth. So Lester Piggott does it, and the gap now between him and Willie Carson is four. Yes, indeed, one mustn't forget that the uh, other race for the championship definitely really alive as Lester Piggott keeps to pile on the winners. And Willie Carson at the moment just uh, in the doldrums, but no doubt Willie be bouncing back with more winners. Meanwhile, Lester is right on target, and as Bruff said, now four behind Willie Carson. And so Popsy's Joy has had a really marvellous season, winning six races before today. Third in the Shaftesbury, third to Shaftesbury, I should say, in the Tote Eva, has now picked up a Tote race, and this time it's a winner's prize of 20,000 and a half to his owner, Mr. Victor Morley Lawson. Mr. Victor Morley Lawson, of course, a very accomplished amateur and a very keen amateur. And uh, he had a ra ride in public not all that long ago, even though, uh, if he doesn't mind me saying, now beginning to go on in advanced years. But there he is at his horse's head, leading him in. That's Mr. Victor Morley Lawson, a very keen horseman. And this one comes from Epsom, trained by Michael Haynes and ridden by Mr. Pickett. Well, for any owner to win the marathon of the Desarowitz once is quite a feat, but he's done it twice. Just saying the same colours, carried the victory by Ocean King in 1974. A really marvellous double for this very popular owner. And so with Pops's Joy now in the unsaddling enclosure, having beaten Pop away, let's get the full rundown of starting prices from John Tyrrell. Anchor John, first number six, Pops's Joy at 10 to 1. Second number 24, Pop Away, 14 to 1. Third number 16, Athford, 22 to 1. And fourth number 9, Chateau Royal, 33 to 1. Al Q Wait was the 7 to 2 favourite and 27 ran. Food and the story of four orphan barn owls found on a building site who've been saved. But first it's Southport with Fred Dynage and David Bowman. Welcome to you, and on South Sport tonight, we've Speedway, Football and Tennis. Dave Bobin reporting from the Brighton Centre on Europe's richest indoor event for women. But we open with racing and that really quite extraordinary fellow, our racing expert, John Tyrrell. When our last week on South Sport, I was most unfairly castigating the intrepid Tyrrell for not giving us enough winners. As ever, he sat calmly through it all and then tipped these three horses to win Saturday's big race, the Totes of Zalowicz, the second leg of the autumn double at Newmarket. Popsy's Joy was his main selection, but watch out as well, he said, for Popaway and Athford. Well worth a bet. Well, this is how the race ended. So they pass a two foul on from home marker. Pop away now in the lead. But Lester Pickett going very smoothly on Popsy Joy in second place. And they come now to last well on a half. And it's Lester Pickett on the outside. Popsy Joy, Pop away on the far side. That's the leading two. And so they pass a foul on from home marker. And it's Popsy Joy and Lester Pickett in the lead from Pop away in second place. Then comes Hafford in third. As they come up towards the line, Popsy Joy late in his stride. Goes away to win the dope to Darwin from Pop away in second place. Then comes Hafford over in third. Yes, victory for Popsy's Joy, John Tyrrell's main selection to win the Cesarewitch at 10 to 1. Second, Popaway, Tyrrell's second selection at 14 to 1. Third, Athford, Tyrrell's third selection at 22 to 1. Now, the odds against John Tyrrell naming the first three horses in the race, regardless of finishing order, were something like 3,080 to 1. So, well done, JT, and that very popular South Sport feature, Tyrrell's midweek winner, returns on November the 10th to coincide with a new jumping season. 
Right, well now Speedway and what a marvellous season it's been for Reading, although the team has drawn one on Little Wolf who drifted from five to one. The best French form because the noble player won one run, this son of Troy. He was a good second to Ministerial who was doing his usual hanging.